chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and let's look at verse number 17, we'll read verses 17 and 18, verses 17 and 18, Paul writes here, under the living of the Holy Spirit of God, wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So the Lord gives us an instruction here, and it's one that we're familiar with, one we actually looked at before in our studies, when we were talking about separation as far as Christians uh, being separate from the world. He uh, instructs us to be separate or to be distinctly different. Now, uh, let someone read verses 17 and 18 and, and get confused that works are a part of salvation because he tells us to be separate. And then in verse number 18, he says, And will be a father unto you. He's not saying that if a person does good or has good works, that ultimately then he will become their father and they will become his child and they will be saved and go to heaven. He actually mentions that the people that are being instructed here are saved individuals in verse number 16. He talks about them being his people. So he's instructing saved individuals, Christians, or born-again believers, however you want to refer to them. But what he's saying is, is as you come out from among the world, and as you live separate, then ultimately we will have that father-son, father-daughter relationship. If you don't come out from among the world, then you can't enjoy that relationship with God. Why? Because God hates sin. He doesn't hate sinners, but He hates sin. And He cannot dwell with sin, just like light cannot dwell with darkness. It's either light or it's dark. They're opposites. Well, God is pure and holy. He is not sinful. And so where sin abounds, he's, uh, the Bible says grace did much more abound. God can dwell with and have a relationship with an individual who is living holy and trying to be separate from the world. But a person who allows sin to abound in their life and not grace, ultimately, they're not going to enjoy that relationship with God that he wants them to have, which is the relationship of a father with his child. Now, with all that said, we started this lesson last week, and I apologize once again that we weren't able to hand these lessons out, uh, but hopefully you can go over the first part of this lesson on your own, because remember, all the film blanks uh, are taken from the Word of God, so you can look these verses up and ultimately fill in those blanks. The first section that we covered, or uh, the part that we covered last week was the first section, and that... Uh, statement, why Baptists don't drink alcohol. Now, someone might say, why does it say why Baptists don't drink alcohol? Well, there used to be a time in our society in which Christians didn't drink alcohol. But unfortunately, the term Christian is being used loosely and in a general way today. So, I am a Christian, first and foremost. Let me say that today. I am a born-again believer who is trying to live my life like the Lord Jesus Christ. But I am a Baptist in the fact that I line up with what the Baptist church and the Baptist believers of old uh, believed and held to as far as faith. And we can really sum it up this way. Uh, the word Baptist, as I believe we've already studied, can be used as an acrostic. And each letter uh, in the word Baptist can stand for something. The very first letter, B, stands for biblical authority. That's really where it starts and ends. I'm a Baptist today because I believe this book is the final authority for every area, every aspect of my life. Amen. I do not believe that the Bible is incomplete, but rather that it is complete. It is perfect. It is without error. It is the Holy Word of God. And it is here for me as instruction to show me, number one, how to be saved, which I know as a believer. And then, number two, how to live my life after being saved. And so, uh, it says, why Baptists don't drink alcohol? Now, once again, we're going to review all of this because we looked at this last week. 
Uh, but I would encourage you to do that on your own time if you weren't able to be here or to fill those in as you have time this week for those of you that were. The second section that we're going to go to is why Baptists don't gamble. Why Baptists don't gamble. The popular slogan promoting a lottery says millions won weekly. But it fails to tell the other side of the story. Countless millions lost weekly. Isn't that how the devil works? Just like with alcohol. Growing up, I've mentioned this before, and I believe pretty much everybody in this congregation can relate to this. Growing up, I saw TV commercials, and you would see these uh, advertisements for liquor, for beer, and they would talk about how it tasted great and how it was less filling, and they argued over the reason why they were drinking it, but they never showed you the repercussions in that individual's life for drinking that alcohol. They never showed you the regrets and the remorse that that individual had because of the foolish decisions that he or she made because of alcohol and the influence of alcohol in their life. Well, the same is true with gambling. You know, gambling is promoted, and actually in our society today, there are probably more forms of gambling than there ever has been uh, in society. So, it doesn't, they never tell us that countless millions are lost weekly, and they don't mention the ruined lives, the broken homes, the hungry children, and the accompanying rise in organized crime, prostitution, and theft that sort of go along with gambling. Our country is a nation of gamblers. From raffles to bingos and lotto to racing and casinos, many alluring opportunities are presented to the child of God. Now, let me stop here for a moment because uh, we did do a study on gambling. In fact, after the Sunday School Hour, if you'd like, I've got four uh, little lessons up here. We did these last year in the summer, and they're entitled God's Views on Social Issues. We've got one on alcohol, one on gambling, one on drugs and tobacco, and one on music and dancing. And you're more than welcome to take one of these uh, for each of the subjects. And once again, it's just a Bible study, uh, maybe a little bit more in-depth than what we're doing here. And it can be supplemental to you as far as these are concerned, these topics. But let me say for a minute, because you may have looked there, you may have saw raffling and bingo, and you might have thought to yourself, wait a second, preacher, you mean every time the kid comes and knocks on my door and says, hey, I'm raising funds for Little League or uh, football or whatever, that's gambling? Here's what gambling is. It's a mindset that you want to get rich quick or the hopes of winning something and you having to go ahead and put something out there in order to possibly win. When kids come by, they sell me uh, raffle tickets for, for these uh, different um, you know, leagues that they have. I buy them with the intention of supporting that league. Not with the intention of winning a 50-inch TV or 62-inch TV or whatever. Amen. My goal is just to help support them. There you go. Now, once again, that is really, that is what gambling is, is it's more of a mindset. You know, there's a lot of things in life that, uh, that people do in their mindset is to ultimately try to get rich quick, which we're going to talk about that here as to why gambling is wrong. Because God has never intended, and you never see it in the Word of God, where He wanted people to get rich quick. Think about Abraham. Abraham was blessed by God, but he didn't become a rich man overnight. It took a lot of time. It took a lot of effort. It took a lot of work. Think about Solomon. God told Solomon, hey, you can have whatever you want. You can have wisdom. You can have riches. You can have your enemies on the plate. Whatever you want. And he chose wisdom. And God said, because you chose wisdom, you will also be rich. But once again, it wasn't like overnight he was rich. It took time. God wants us to be a working people. He wants us to be a dependent people, a people that's dependent upon Him. He doesn't want us to be a people that is in love with money or in love with things and ultimately dependent upon those things. And that is really what, what is wrong with gambling, is it's the mindset of wanting these things and being dependent on these things and being independent of God. So let's look at this study real quick. I just want to make sure I clarify that because, once again, uh, I know that there are innocent activities that occur some, and, and, and sometimes and, and innocent fundraisers that are done, and I don't want you to think that I, as a preacher, or our church is against those things, okay? But we are against this mindset, this gambling mindset. 
So what does the Bible have to say on this matter? Well, gambling is an insult to God. Someone says an insult to God. Why is that? Well, let's look over to Philippians chapter number 4 and verse number 19. Philippians chapter number 4 and verse number 19. And the Bible says here, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So Paul told the Philippians, God will supply your needs. And we know today, in the 21st century, that this principle is as true and as relevant as it was 2,000 years ago. That God still today will supply our needs. He has been faithful and always will be faithful to supply the needs of believers. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter number 9, turn on there with me if you would. 2 Corinthians chapter number 9 and verse number 8. The Bible says here, 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. So God is going to see to it that we as His children will have a sufficient, all su sufficiency in all things. When we gamble, ultimately what we are saying to the Lord is, I don't think you're going to keep your promise to take care of me. So I'm going to take care of myself. Now once again, the guy that goes down to the to buy the lottery ticket, or the guy that goes to the casino, and he's sitting there and spending away his life savings, or maybe he's just going there with the intent of spending $20, but his mindset is, I'm hoping I'm going to put one of these coins in, one of these dollars in, and I'm going to win the big one. <laughs> That's a wrong mindset. Because ultimately what he is saying is, God, the principle that you have said where you will meet my need, I don't believe it's going to happen. Or, I want more than you can supply for me. Now, there's nothing beyond God's supply, but remember, sometimes God tells us there are things He doesn't want us to have. Yeah. How many times have we heard about people who have gambled, they've won, and they've ended up becoming a loser as a result because they went into depression, they had everybody come out of the woodwork to try to get a piece of the high from them. Yeah. You know, they ultimately end up worse off than they started. It sort of reminds me of that story that the Lord Jesus talked about where with a man who had a demon in his house and the demon was cast out and he left, he, you know, the house was swept and garnished and he came back and found the house worse than it was before because now there were seven demons or, or multiple demons in this house. Ultimately, the principle is that sometimes people look for something and they're hoping for it to be the answer and it's not the answer. Because Jesus is the only answer. Yes. God is the only solution. And a relationship with God is the solution. So it's an insult to God. Come on. What if you as a parent said to your child, Hey, listen. Don't worry. Dad is going to go ahead and make sure that there's food on the table. I'll make sure you have clothes on your back. I'll make sure that the electricity is kept on and you can take hot showers. There's a roof over your head. And your child... No matter what age they are, 6 or 10 or 14, say, you know, yeah, I appreciate that, uh, but I think I'm going to go out and get myself a job anyhow. Because I'm just not confident that you're going to keep your promise to me. Yeah. You would be insulted as a parent because your child is to be dependent upon you. They, when they get older, they learn independence. We raise them so that they can be independent and move out and live on their own. But as a child, and that's what we are, children of God, we're to be dependent on Him. Second reason uh, why gambling is wrong, and the second thing that the Bible tells us about it, is that gambling is spiritually dangerous. <laughs> 1 Timothy chapter number 6 and verse number 9. 1 Timothy chapter number 6 and verse number 9. It says, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. And into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. So, ultimately, we're told here through Paul's letter to Timothy, his son in the Lord, hey, people that are rich, they don't have uh, a hunky-dory life just because they're rich. 
Once again, a lot of times we who might consider ourselves middle class, some of us might consider ourselves low class, some of us uh, I know some here might say we have no class. I would agree with that. Uh, we say, we look and we say, you know what? If I was just rich, if I just had a million dollars, everything would be better. We were talking uh, the other night, Wednesday night, I believe it was, we were by Brother G's house and we were talking and that <laughs> all came out and we were talking about her looking for a house and yeah. praying with her about finding a house. And she said, Pastor, I can't believe it. She said, you can't find anything under $200,000 in that water anymore. She said, it's crazy. You used to think if I got a million dollars, I would be okay. She goes, but now a million dollars just barely buys your house in some places. Yeah. You know, when I was growing up, if you had a million dollars, you were set for life. At least it seemed like it at the age of 12, you know, because all I was going to live on was soda, pop, and bubble gum. Hey, hey. But nonetheless, the point is, is that, you know, it's pretty dangerous. It, having that money, there are so many temptations that come with it. Because you know what? A lot of people say it. If I were to be rich, you know what? Well, monetarily, I would be free to do anything. And that's a, that's a scary thing. Yes, it is. Because you might do some things that later on you'll regret. Mm -hmm. And go to some places that later on you'll wish you hadn't gone. And ultimately miss out on your relationship with God because you'd be so busy spending that money that you miss that Bible time and prayer time and you miss that time in God's house. A lot of times people say, well, I would, I would give it to the missionaries. And you've heard many preachers say before, if you won't give 10% uh, of what you have now to God, you won't give 10% of a million dollars to God if He gives you a million dollars. It's a dangerous thing to be rich. The other thing that the Bible says about gambling is it's basically a selfish thing. In the book of Exodus, chapter number 20, Exodus in the Old Testament, second book of the Bible, Chapter number 20 and verse number 17. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. We're instructed in the Ten Commandments not to covet. No one gambles to lose. Now, people may, once again, people may be involved in some of these types of things like bingo and raffle because it's entertainment or because they're supporting, uh, you know, uh, an event, an activity uh, in their community. But people that are actually wanting to win some money, they don't go in there saying, man, I hope I lose today. I'm taking $200 with me and I hope I lose it all. No, they're not doing that. They're hoping to win. The prime motivation for all forms of gambling is to gain what is not owned. That is covetousness. Why do you think, back in the day, when we had uh, community events, community activities, and we needed to raise funds, people would be able to say, hey, we're trying to raise funds for the Boy Scouts. We're trying to raise funds for this activity. And people would donate out of the goodness and kindness of their heart. Now you have to entice people to do it. Because they only want to do it if they think that they can win something. That just shows you the type of uh, mentality that we have here in the United States now. Uh, 1 Timothy 6 10, which we looked at, this verse doesn't teach that money is a problem, but rather the love of money. In 1 Timothy, I, I'm sorry, I said we looked at 1 Timothy 6 10. We looked at 1 Timothy 6 9. Let me read 1 Timothy 6 10 for you. It should be on the back there. Uh, like I said, some of us have no class. No, I'm just kidding. Verse 2. Usher's in the back. Take this man out of here. Verse 2 be 6.10. For the love of money is the root of all evil. While, while some have, which while some have coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So, once again, money is not the problem, but the love of it is in Genesis chapter number 3, the next verse that's listed there on your papers. Genesis chapter number 3, and this is going back to uh, the time in the Garden of Eden and the fall of mankind. In Genesis chapter 3, verse number 19, we read ultimately the pronouncement upon man from God for, uh, for failing to obey God. 
in verse 19, and the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. God intends man to live by the sweat of his face, not to, to work for a living. You know, it's a principle of God that there must be work before wealth and sowing before reaping. And gambling goes against this law because ultimately the gambler seeks to reap what others have sown. He all has a selfish mentality. I want to win from uh, somebody else's wealth rather than work for my own. Another thing that the Bible tells us about gambling is it's poor stewardship. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 4 and verse number 2 in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter number 4 and verse number 2. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. So, nobody ever really wins by indulging in gambling. And they are becoming a poor steward of what God has given them. Because God requires each Christian to be a good steward over all that has been given to his hand. As we've already learned in our previous studies. That we are stewards or servants of God. And ultimately, taking that money and putting it out there by chance, uh, hoping to win, that is poor stewardship. We are instructed over and over again in the Word of God to take what God has given to us and to invest it in something that is worthwhile, that is beneficial, that's going to be fruitful. You know, ultimately, you can't get a better return on your money than investing in missionaries. That is the best investment you could make. Amen. Honestly, because one day you're going to stand before God, I'm going to stand before God, and you know who else is going to be out there in heaven? The people that will reach as a result of missionaries. Amen. And missionaries need people to support them. Good. Yeah, that is wise stewardship. Investing in missionaries. Investing in others in your local community. Hey, when's the last time, and I know I've said this before, but when's the last time you took a young Christian and said, you know what, let's go down to McDonald's and I'll, I'll buy you a coffee. Used to be a dollar, I think now it's a dollar forty-nine. Alright, uh, let's, let's, I'll, I'll, I'll spend a dollar forty-nine and we'll sit down, I'll get you know, two apple pies for a buck, for about five dollars, we'll sit down, and we'll just fellowship, see how you're doing. You can tell me if you have any prayer requests. Someone says, well, preacher, uh, that $5 could go somewhere else. You, you don't have a better investment in life than investing in other people, honestly, and reaching other people and discipling other people. So God wants us to be a good steward, and gambling is for stewardship. Another thing, gambling is often plain superstition. You know, it often uh, involves lucky numbers, lucky systems, keeping your fingers crossed. Hopefully my dad doesn't mind me telling the story. I remember growing up, my dad was not in church. Uh, he was not even a born-again Christian. And uh, I remember he would play the lottery sometimes. And he would try everything he could. He would take my mom's birth date, my birth date, my sister's birth date, you know, he'd use those numbers. And then if they didn't win, he would try something else the next time. And a lot of people do that because they're all thinking, hey, I just need that lucky number. People go down to the casinos and they're playing the games and they take the dice and they roll and come on, lucky number seven, you know. And, and whether they realize it or not, they are putting their faith and trust in a, a dice or in a number. There's no such thing as luck. The Bible teaches us that there's no such thing as luck. Everything happens for a reason. Just like there's no coincidences in life. A man is not a lucky man. He is a blessed man. Uh, if God's hand is upon him, and so, ultimately, gambling so, uh, turns people to superstition. In Isaiah 47, uh, chapter 47, and verses 12 and 13, let me read to you there what the Bible says. Stand now with thy enchantments, and with the multitude of thy sorceries, wherein thou hast labored from thy youth. If so be, thou shalt be able to profit. If so be, thou mayest prevail. Thou art weary in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. Here in Isaiah 47, the Lord talks about how that the people of God, the, His people, the Israelites, 
how that ultimately they had turned to all these other sources. He mentions the astrologers, those that look at the stars, and they say uh, when Virgo is in line with Jupiter. I remember back on the old Disney movie, uh, Fall of Wee Boys, uh, you had Lemon Simmons, and he's sitting on the bus, and someone asked him, you know, what's your sign? And they read it out of the newspaper what it was, uh, what it said, and, and they said, be careful about making rash decisions. And all of a sudden, they stop in this little town. He gets off the bus, and he says, you know what? I think I'm done with this traveling man. I'm going to get me a real job. And so he goes in, and he gets himself a job at a little uh, shop or a little a market. And uh, one of the guys goes, I remember, watch out! Maybe just a thing to laugh about, but there are people that will take those uh, those uh, prophecies that are in the newspaper and they'll use them and they'll believe in them and they will look to superstition and to luck. And God says, hey, nothing is lucky in this life. Don't look to superstitions because ultimately they detract you from looking to me. Keep your eyes on God. In Romans 8 48, we know the Bible says, all things work together for good to them. That love God. In First Peter five seven, we know we're told to cast casting all your cares uh, or all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. We are to lay our burdens upon the Lord. We are to remember that everything that happens in this life, as long as we are uh, uh, staying right with God and loving God in a right way, that everything that happens, God can take it and use it for good in our lives. Then gambling, last off, makes one insensitive to the will of God. It makes one insensitive to the will of God. According to John chapter number 19, verses 23 and 24, the Roman soldiers gambled for the clothes of the crucified Lord. Yes. They were completely unaware of the event transpiring in their presence. When anyone is consumed with self-interest, they are most insensitive to the things of the Lord. Think about that for a moment if you would. Here is the Savior of the world hung on the cross in agony, in pain, bearing the sins of all mankind upon him. And think of this picture. Off to the side, you've got these soldiers that are casting lots for his raiment, gambling over who's going to get to take his raiment with them, his clothing with them. Totally missing the picture. Thinking about the physical, the temporal, rather than the spiritual and the eternal. You know, that's... That's really ultimately what happens in a person's life is they get consumed by gambling. Once again, someone might say, well, you know, if I just do this, it's not that bad. If, if I just play this, you know, even now with all of our sports, there, there are a lot of ways that people can gamble with sports and sporting events. If I just do this, it's not that bad. It's just like alcohol. One drink is all it takes. One time gambling is all it takes. And you get a taste of that in your mouth. You get a taste of that money in your hands and you have to be careful because it could send you further down the road. I have a, a family member and uh, he told me one time about how he had never gambled before in his life. But he decided he was passing through uh, one of the cities in, in, in Nevada. I can't remember if it was Reno or Vegas. But you know, if you've ever passed through Nevada, you stop to do anything. You stop to gas up, you stop to go in and get, uh, you know, some chips and soda. And there are slot machines and gambling, you know, these electronic gambling machines everywhere. I was shocked the first time my wife and I, after we were married, we stopped in Reno, and I went in to pay for my gas. I thought I was walking through a casino to, to ultimately pay for my gas. And uh, so he said, you know, we went inside and it was one of these types of uh, uh, setups. It was a little market. And he said they had these gambling machines. And he thought, you know, I've never tried before, but I'm, I'm just going to put one quarter in. And so he put one quarter in it. And he said, you know what happened? He said, I won 20 bucks. He said, but I never did it again. Because I know the next time I do it, I'm going to lose. And I'm going to keep losing. And, you know, he at least was wise enough. He shouldn't have probably played the first quarter. But... He was wise enough to at least know how it works. As we were at Master's Men, Brother Schrock preached a great message, and I'll, and I'll close with this, about how that Satan is like a good hunter or a good fisherman. He puts out traps or baits 
or he puts out hooks. And he knows that if he gets you on the hook, he can reel you in. That's why it's important to stay away from these types of vices, whether it be alcohol or gambling or smoking or drugs or whatever. These other topics are that we'll be finishing here in the next couple of weeks. Stay away from them. It's just better for you spiritually. So let's go to the Lord. Father, thank you for all you've done for us. Thank you for all you've given to us. Now please uh, continue to bless us, we ask. Father, we, uh, we want to live lives that honor and glorify you.